out on yet another epic week-long hiking trip. I did just spontaneously last minute book it and it is going to be a solo trip along the iconic 100km Great Ocean Walk. Now I'm just about to head out so come with me and I'll share a little bit more of it with you. So as you just heard this week I'm hiking and sharing with you the Great Ocean Walk. This is considered one of Victoria's iconic Great Walks and runs 100 kilometers from Apollo Bay to the Twelve Apostles, following the coast just below the stunning Great Ocean Road, obviously another must do while you're in Victoria. The walk passes through both the Great Otway National Park and Port Campbell National Park, providing gorgeous scenery, friendly wildlife, easy to follow coastal trails and beautiful seaside campsites. Parks Victoria do ask that the trail be walked only one way, east to west, to help with the management of the trail and stop the spread of plant diseases such as root rot being potentially brought in and spread on hikers' shoes. As a result, kicking off day one, I drove to the Twelve Apostles where I personally chose to leave my car and caught a public bus back to Apollo Bay to start the walk. Obviously, if you do have friends or family in the area to give you a lift, that would be a great option, but otherwise private transport can be arranged, it's just quite expensive to do. From here, the walk itself starts at the Apollo Bay Visitor Centre, a great little spot right on the coast where you'll find this iconic wooden platform and Great Ocean Walk sign as your marker for the start of the trail. The walk then leads through town along the coast following footpaths and street signs, through Marengo, again along the coast through its seaside caravan park and out onto the headlands and heath edged paths. I certainly got lucky with the weather, it is so hot out here today but just look at it, it is so pretty already. Today's stretch runs just 10.3 kilometres through to the Elliott Ridge campsites, the first campground on the Great Ocean Walk. The path is absolutely filled with beautiful coastal vegetation, wildlife like this gorgeous lizard, and beach walking at low tide. The entirety of the track follows a number of markers and signs to decision points, marking areas of danger at high tide, with rough seas or rock and water crossings, occasionally offering alternative inland routes to follow. The views on the open coastline, however, were absolutely incredible, easily showing how this walk earns its title as one of Victoria's most iconic. Again, living up to its name from day one, the beaches on this walk were covered in everything from starfish to interesting little shells, making for a great walk through to the campsite. Day two starts with coffee in the campground's much appreciated camp shelter. The area is surrounded by forest and just full of koalas, which I am about to show you a few more of on our walk today. So heading out of the campground, I actually heard someone just absolutely scream and I thought, oh my gosh, it has to be a snake. But no, turns out it came from a hiking group who had come across a koala on the ground and almost walked into it. Obviously they were just surprised, but totally okay. And here is that little cutie. The track today does pretty well follow fire trails for the 12 kilometers from Elliott Ridge to Blanket Bay. So I did walk the first five or so kilometers of that with that hiking group, as we literally are just walking the same direction. Now, as you know, I personally am walking between the campgrounds back to my car over the week. This group, however, was from Sydney, and I just share this because I think it might be of interest to anyone else considering doing the Great Ocean Walk themselves. 
but they alternatively were walking the same trail, just getting a hired minibus back to private accommodation at the end of each day, which is a really cool option to at least know about if you don't want to camp, but definitely more expensive. Anyway, after following a few more fire and management trails, you come back out to the beach at Blanket Bay. Normally, following the Vic Park's hiking itinerary, this now would be your stop for the night. For me, however, it was completely booked out online, so I just used it as a nice little lunch stop instead. This is a quick look around the campground and waterfall for you. It does also meet conveniently with conventional vehicle access, as I mentioned, obviously meaning you can get picked up if you want to do a shorter section of the walk. For me, our walk continues then for another 105 kilometers from Blanket Bay to the Cape Otway campground. This is a much more coastal section of the track, wandering through open vegetation for really quite pretty clifftop views. Back onto the beach, there is a very minor water crossing, then again here at the Parker River Estuary Crossing. As I'm sure you can imagine, it is simply tidal, so if you did put a bit more research into the tide times than me, and weather depending, you could probably avoid walking through it altogether. I really don't mind getting my boots off for a bit of water. What did bother me here though was the sheer amount of what appeared to be blue bottles brought in on the tide floating around in the water. Thankfully, I did not get stung, so it was straight up these stairs before more coastal cliff top walking, passing above Crayfish Bay, and through the heath to arrive at Cape Otway Light Station. Again, this is completely publicly accessible by road if you wanted to check out this section. All for Hikers does continue along a well marked path for a short distance to the Cape Otway Hike in Campground. A beautiful spot for the night, accommodating I'd say about eight tent sites and one group area, much like the majority of the Great Ocean Walk campgrounds. Day three was quite a short one with just 10 kilometers to cover. So I really did take my time having breakfast and just watching all the little birds that are so prevalent throughout these campgrounds. Again, having time to look around and explore the history of the area, the first stop of the morning was to the historical Cape Otway Cemetery to visit the graves of fallen sailors, lightkeepers and their families. Tragically, a few of whom were infant deaths given the remote nature and inaccessibility of early life at the station. A further few kilometres and we reach the track junction to Station Beach East Access. The Great Ocean Walk here follows the cliff top along an inland track or, alternatively, with low tides can be walked along the sand on Station Beach. There is also an optional turn off here to walk to Rainbow Falls. Personally, I didn't think it was quite worthwhile. The falls, despite their name, are more of a spring-fed algae-covered rock that you can see from the trail at the end of the beach and will add a few kilometers of beach walking to your day. For me, the beach itself definitely was worth the soft sand. And honestly, considering this is the Great Ocean Walk, I was a little surprised just how little of it actually had to be completed down on the beaches. Unfortunately, I did come across a dead seal, which was a little sad but otherwise a nice part of the walk before returning to the cliff tops and main track. The last stint of the day drops away from the ocean down to the Air River campground, opening up to beautiful river views and fishing for day visitors and walk-in camping just beyond the tree line for walk-in campers. Here the trees are once again filled with koalas. You can refill drinking and cooking water from rainwater tanks and take the afternoon to relax by the water before continuing on to day four. Once again rainy and a bit grey looking, the camp shelter was a great spot to start. 
before jumping back on trail today to move towards Johanna Beach and the beautiful Johanna Beach hiking campground on its western end. It is just a little bit rainy this morning so I have got the pack cover on but I think it's clearing up so we'll see how we go. The walk today runs another 14 kilometres but continues just four before actually meeting and running very briefly parallel with the Great Ocean Road at the Castle Cove Lookout. This area is just alive at the moment with little flowers and unfortunately, as I said, quite wet. Moving away from the road, hikers continue across a section of boardwalk, through boot cleaning stations, and like the local wildlife, onto grass trees and eucalypt woodland. Now the beach stretch today, I walked with another girl I met on trail. This stint is probably only a few kilometers, but still meant we had to get the boots off to cross over the tidal Johanna River and make our way up to the campground on the other side for a beautiful but wet afternoon. Day five, what a way to wake up this morning was after the rain. Honestly, just check out this for clifftop camping. Again, you've got your shelter, beautiful view over the water, and then another 14 kilometers through to today's destination. Now, if you're watching this and thinking, Laura, honestly, that all looks beautiful, but those distances between camps each day are just sounding awfully short then stick with me because I completely agree. The distances I thought were just way too short for the ease of walking this trail. Having decided so last minute to book and do the walk, I just assumed that the best way to complete it would be to take the advice and itinerary of Vic Parks and do the walk over their recommended eight days or seven in my case as one campground as you saw was booked out. Now in hindsight, or for anyone thinking of doing this walk, I have to personally recommend that a week in decent weather is a very leisurely way to do it and absolutely not necessary unless you really enjoy your downtime each night at camp. My recommendation instead is that you skip a few campgrounds, walking the 100 kilometers instead over just four or five days, but you can of course adjust that to however much time you may need. Anyway, back to day five. As you've just seen, today moves inland past some stunning farming properties and continues on walking on road through rainforest type vegetation for a lot of the day. Eventually you pass through gated access down quite a slippery patch to Melanesia Beach. Across a shallow creek and over the sand, again optional if you'd rather take an inland track. Obviously the beach here is the less popular option with the track back up being completely overgrown. Then cutting back onto the main track, absolutely covered in blackberry and raspberry vines. Tonight's camp is at Ryan's Den and honestly I wasn't that excited about it thinking it would be completely blocked in by trees on the headland but it did turn out to be quite a lovely spot with individual campsites and great open ocean lookout views for dinner, overlooking my tent site and for an ocean sunset with the other girls I'd met between our rainy weather. morning it is day six now I think it's probably about eight o'clock and I'm still in my tent eating breakfast obviously a little bit of a late one but I think I only have about 13 k's to go today so I thought we'd just have a little bit of a chill morning before we get back out there I no joke have such a mess going on on this tent right now I've kind of been trying to repack everything make it fit a little bit nicer in my backpack while I'm waiting for my tent to dry out but yeah there you go there's the um reality of hiking for a week well past the halfway point now, day six travels 13 kilometers from Ryan's Den to the Devil's Kitchen campground. 
This one's mostly an inland day, quite similarly to what you've seen already. You've got a bit of option with the tides, but otherwise we move up through the hills. So just here on top of this ridge line, that's where we camped last night, where we had that beautiful sunset from. Round some gates, along some roads, under and over this electric fence. to carry on to the gable lookout. And finally finishing either over Wreck Beach, which I missed the tides for, or inland track for a gentle bushwalk, as you can see here. A number of people warned me about snakes here, not that I personally saw any. And here we go, it has just started to rain, but final campground for the Great Ocean Walk. And here we go, I just had to leave you with this view. One final pack down of my tent for the final day on trail. Naturally the weather waited just until I started packing up to rain, but then straight onto trail this morning with another couple of lovely people I met at camp. It was quite nice seeing as seemingly everyone had pre-booked campsites for the entire week of walking that you were able to make friends and run into and catch up with the same people each day despite completing each section at your own pace. In fact, a question I do get quite a lot either hiking or travelling on my own is whether I get lonely and I hope as this video shows it's actually quite hard to do that as there's always so many people who are usually quite friendly and like-minded around to chat and share the experience with. Now, back to this final day, this is a 16 kilometer stretch, so the longest day of the walk, if you're completing it as recommended, but also quite an easy walk moving along the coast, down past the Jellybrand River for one final coffee stop to enjoy being out on this coastal landscape for the morning, through the Princetown Recreation Reserve, over the Jellybrand River Bridge and up over the hills to finally get our first glimpse of the Twelve Apostles ahead. Here I actually ran into a few members of the hiking group from day two, so as I mentioned no shortage of friendly faces around. And then headed up to one final lookout platform standing above the cliffs with the visitor centre and walks end in sight. This is a beautiful spot and thankfully equally nice weather to finish with a great ocean walk sign written here marking out the near completion of this week's trip. The Great Ocean Walk finishes past Gibson Steps, under the Great Ocean Road, and at the visitor centre of the area's real icon, the Twelve Apostles, where I was lucky enough to end and again catch up with this beautiful group of people I had met and gotten to know just a little throughout our week of walking this iconic trail together. Now, would I recommend this walk to someone else? Yes, absolutely. Am I glad I personally completed it? Look, I'd say definitely. It was quite a nice, rewarding experience and just a beautiful area to see. And would I do it again? Well, it's certainly possible in future, but for now I have a lot more I want to see. And it's something that I'd certainly do shorter, just not for such an extended period of time in future. Anyway, thank you all for joining me on this week of hiking. It's been a pleasure to be back out on trail, so I hope you've enjoyed experiencing it along the way with me.